So now we're, we're starting to work through the Gospels, given those four attributes of reliable eyewitness testimony. Uh, were they written early enough? Can they be corroborated in some way? Have they changed their story over time? And are they in some way unaffected by bias? Okay, we talked about whether they're early enough, and they are. But maybe they're just an early lie. How do we still, well, we need to ask some more questions. Can we corroborate the statements of the gospel authors in any way? Now, there are two ways you can ever corroborate uh, an eyewitness's statement. One, have they been internally consistent? Do they make uh, self-refuting statements? Do they, do they uh, say things that are not even consistent with what they said yesterday or what they said a few minutes ago? So we're looking always when we talk to eyewitnesses to see if they're internally um, consistent. A second way we might do is to say, well, is there anything other than the witness, outside of the witness, unaffected by the witness, that might corroborate the statement of the witness? So we're always looking at internal corroboration and external corroboration. Corroboration that's not dependent on the witness at all. I think we can do the same thing with the gospel authors. So when we're talking about these two kinds of categories, internal and external evidence, and we apply this to the gospel authors, is there some way we could check these both internally and externally? Yeah, there is. Let's start with that category of internal evidence. One of the things that struck me immediately as I was reading through the Gospels for the very first time as an unbeliever was what I call unintentional eyewitness support. Unintentional eyewitness support. I've given a couple of examples of this in your participant's guide. This is when you have one witness who comes in and says something to you, offers a statement, and you're thinking to yourself, really, how in the world could that be true? Are you sure? And I said, well, this is what I saw. And it's, they leave you hanging with some open, uh, unanswered question that sure enough, you don't even get answered until you speak to a second witness a day later. And then they offer the missing piece, the detail that makes sense of the first eyewitness account. This happens all the time in criminal investigations. It is the earmark of reliable eyewitness testimony when you have unintentional support that fills in the gaps one to the other and puzzles together and makes sense of the account. That's why we want more than one witness to tell us what happened. Something very similar happens in the Gospels. Let me give you an example of this. In one account in the Gospels, Jesus is in front of Caiaphas, and, uh, and he's being tested. And a challenge is posed to Jesus. Oh, you think you're God? Okay, how about this? Someone strikes him and he says, prophesy, Jesus. Tell us who hit you. That's the account? That's it? Yeah. Well, how hard would that be for Jesus to tell the person who hit him who hit him? That would be very easy, wouldn't it? You just, well, look, dude, you just hit me. I just saw you do it. If all you had was that one eyewitness account, this, this idea that somehow Jesus' ability to identify his attacker shows his, his divinity, that's like, uh, makes no sense at all. Of course, there's another account out there, I've listed it for you in your participant's guide, that tells us why this would actually be prophecy. In the second account, we learned that Jesus was blindfolded at this point. That was not offered by the first eyewitness. That was left out, so it made no sense when he first said it, but now we know he was blindfolded. The second witness puts together and fills in the gap, puzzles together. It's this unintentional eyewitness support. Now, years later, I discovered there was, someone had been writing about this, even a century before I had been investigating it, and had called these the undesigned coincidences. J.J. Blunt wrote a book called The Undesigned Coincidences of the Gospels. Oh my goodness, I had never uh, even heard of those kinds of things uh, described that way, but I had identified these in my work forensically in the Gospels because I saw how the Gospel accounts came together in exactly the kind of way we would expect this kind of internal evidence, this kind of internal corroboration. But there's more, of course, internally, right? Do, do, for example, do the writers mention the right cities? The right names. Well, uh, why would that be important, Jim? Well, because there are other late gospels written centuries after the life of Jesus. Did you know that? They're written in places like North Africa and different regions and Egypt, places where people didn't know the cities around Jerusalem in Israel. They didn't know those cities by name, the small little cities. The gospel authors apparently did though. They actually mentioned them by name, but the late heretical gospels that aren't true, they don't know those cities at all. As a matter of fact, usually the only city that's mentioned in those is Jerusalem, the big cities. They don't know the minor cities, but the gospel authors did. Even better yet, I've mentioned in a, a study that was done several years ago in which uh, a researcher looked at all the names of, 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 of men and women, Jewish men and women in the first century. Then it turns out the most popular names for Jewish men in Egypt in the first century were very different than the most popular names for men, Jewish men in Israel. 
And it turns out when you do all the study that the gospel authors get it right. They just happen to know what the most popular names for men and women were in the first century in Israel. Well, why do they know? Because they're actually reporting it at the time as they knew it. This is yet another evidence this is not late and it's not written out of the region. These are written by people who knew the geography, who knew the cities, who knew even the names that were used for the people who lived there. But now let's take a shift and move from internal evidence to external evidence. How would we know, is there anything externally that would help us to know if um, Christianity is true as recorded in the Gospels? Well, what would we use for that? Well, here's a couple of things we could use. Archaeology is one great way to uh, confirm the, the contents of the scriptures. Now, I will tell you that all archaeology is a discipline of fractions. So I would never expect that every single city, every single event recorded in the New Testament, I could then find archeological corroboration for. These are very ancient claims, and uh, all of archeological uh, digs are just fractional. You don't even know, for example, what you're digging is necessarily biblical. You've only uncovered a fraction of the sites that are out there. Only a fraction of those have been cataloged. Only a fraction of those are actually New Testament sites. So there's a reason we would not expect to find everything. But I would expect to find something. Let me give you an interesting comparison so you can think about it. The Book of Mormon requires a thousand, uh, it actually records a thousand year history on the North American continent. It's describing a number of civilization groups, cities, government structures, monetary systems, and people. Yet, in all the years we've tried to dig for this, we've never discovered a single foundation of a single city, a single name from the Book of Mormon, a single inscription, a single coin, nothing to corroborate the claims of that book. I wouldn't expect to see everything, but I would expect to see something. When I see nothing, I become suspicious. The claims of the New Testament are not like that. They are rooted in history, a history that's been corroborated by archeology. span Let's go one more step. If we just looked at the non-Christian authors who report something about Christianity, in the uh, first uh, century, let's say, the first 100 years after the events. What would we discover? I've got a list in your participants guide of some ancient authors, Thallus, Tacitus, Marabar, Serapion, uh, Phlegon. All of these are listed now in your participants guide. All I want you to do is to circle the claims about Jesus or the early Christians and to write them on that little list I've given to you this side. I want you to see what they say about Jesus, what they say about Christians. Just circle those words and then transpose them to the list on the side. You've now just created a list of everything that non-Christians said about Jesus in the first hundred years after the fact. If you didn't have a single Christian document, you would still have that list written by non-Christians. What would you know about Jesus? It turns out you'd know an awful lot. That's great corroboration for us because you've got a robust description of the Christian narrative offered not by Christians in the Bible, but by non-Christians who were watching all of this in the first hundred years. That's the kind of thing we're looking for, touch point corroboration. And remember, all corroboration is touch point. If, I, if I've, some witness says, for example, that Jim sat here and touched this chair, and later on you fingerprint the chair, it's gonna actually corroborate the claims of the witness, but that Fingerprint's not gonna tell you anything about what I wore. It's not gonna tell you anything about what I said. So even though it's corroborative evidence, it only captures a point of the statement. Well, it turns out the internal and external evidence related to the New Testament is good touch point evidence that corroborates the claims of the New Testament author. So when we're talking about internal and external corroboration, I provided an illustration in your participants guide, right? It kind of shows that the, the broad brush strokes of the Christian narrative in the gospels is kind of a corroborated and covered by our external corroboration. And then the, the details are then corroborated by the internal corroboration. So we're using both external and internal internal corroboration to get these all the details necessary to know if the narrative is true and corroborated. So now we've got two ways, two tools we've now put in the in our uh, call out bag that actually are specific to the Gospels. One, they were written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses and two, they can be corroborated by both internal and external sources. We're getting close to determining if the Gospels are in fact reliable. <music>